Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. The first reading is uh, Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. This can be found on page 191 of the New Testament. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. As we move on in our conversation about the Holy Spirit, last week we started in Ezekiel 37, Valley of the Dry Bones, and saw how God's breath, God summoned the four winds through Ezekiel, And that breath brought life to these dry bones. We also looked at Genesis 2, 7, when God breathed God's breath into a lifeless Adam, his form that God had created, but wasn't a human being or alive until God's breath, God's Holy Spirit blew into him. Today, we are moving into some of the gospel writer, uh, John's gospel, uh, and his definition of the Holy Spirit. Let's listen. We are in John 14. I'm going to start on verse 15. Listen. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have kept my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me and does not keep my word And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, whom the Father, I'm sorry, will will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So some of you are old enough to remember Mayor Richard Daley, mayor of Chicago for 21 years, 1955 to 1976. He was known to rule with an iron fist with intimidation, with fear, very difficult to work for. Well, in this particular story, one of his speech writers came to him and said, "Uh, Mayor Daley, I would like to ask you for a raise. And Richard Daley kind of scoffs and says, oh, no, you'll get no raise. You're making far too much already, and it should be enough that you're working for me the great American hero. And that was that. 
okay? Or so Mayor Daley thought. So two weeks later, there's a big speech to an audience of veterans. It's being carried nationally, so it's a big deal. So Daly goes up and starts reading his speech, notorious for not reading his speeches ahead of time, which he probably changed after this moment. He is reading and he is on a roll. He is in the middle of the speech and he is telling this crowd of veterans that I am here for you. I am committed to you. Today I am unveiling my 17-point plan that covers agencies in city, state, and on the federal level to make sure that we take care of one of our greatest resources, you, the veterans. Turns the page, and all it says on this next page is, you are on your own now, you great American hero. <laughs> Sometimes we are too arrogant or too self-centered or refuse to ask for help from God who is waiting to be there for us. So today we are studying the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned before, we talked last week in Ezekiel and Genesis, and today we are in John's Gospel. Next week, um, Acts, the Acts 2 passage we'll explore, and that is one of our big three festival days. You have Christmas, you have Easter, and you have Pentecost. Pentecost often gets lost in the shuffle because it's usually right after school's ended, the summer has just begun, and there's only one day that's set aside for Pentecost in this celebration. So we back it out. We do three weeks total because the Holy Spirit is that important for us to understand. Why? Because it is the presence of God that is with us still. In the Old Testament, if you remember, God would speak to prophets and kings and judges. Men and women alike would speak to them either audibly, they could hear, sometimes in visions, sometimes as in the burning bush in pillars of, of clouds and fire. God would come through everyday items or, or um, um, substances in order to speak and convey messages to people. That was Old Testament. That was God's presence. Then God sent Christ, a physical human being that encompassed everything that God would want to say to us. We indeed say that it is God indwelling, God's word became flesh in Christ. So for that time, those 30 some years that Jesus walked this earth, that was the presence of God with us. They could see him and touch him and interact with him, hear him, laugh with him, cry with him, feel pain with him, celebrate with him. So then after the crucifixion and after Jesus ascends to be with God, what, de what descends? The Holy Spirit. And I, I know we can get all confused in, in our Trinity understanding, God, Son, Holy Spirit. How does all that work? But to me, the Holy Spirit is the easiest to understand because it is the presence of God, it is the presence of Christ with us, the Spirit of Christ with us. Sometimes when, let's say you go to Disney World and you were there and you're at a specific attraction or a ride or you're going through the museum where you saw how it came out of Walt Disney's brain, the inspiration for all of this. And you might be at an attraction and say, wow, this really encompasses the spirit of Walt Disney. Or you in, uh, attend a gathering and they say, well, I, I feel the presence of Walt here. He would have liked this. Sometimes those whom we love, who we have lost or who have died and gone to be with Christ, we can have little moments where we remember them, whether it's something in the house that reminds you of them, maybe it's something that they used to listen to, read, see, talk about, maybe a piece of artwork that we look at 
that was special to that loved one, and you might get a sense of that person with you. You might even say, I feel the spirit of that person here with us. We often say that in memorial services. They would have loved this, or I could feel the presence of that person. It's the same way as we talk about the Holy Spirit. It is Christ's presence with us. And so when that spirit descended, it will be, it was, is, and will be the presence of God with us until we go home to God's kingdom to experience God's presence in another way. So it is nothing short of God with us. That's why it's so important and so worthy of our study and celebration. So as John tells us that this Holy Spirit will be sent as an advocate. He uses the word another advocate, meaning that Christ was the first advocate. And when I go, and this is the point in John before Jesus goes to be crucified. In the farewell discourse, as it was last week, we are readying ourselves for when Christ is no longer with them. He's readying his disciples. And he says, I will no longer be with you, but God will send you another advocate. And then this confusing language of God is in me, I am with God, God is with together, you are with me, we're all together, and, and that's right. All that language is meant to convey that the design is for all of us to be so enmeshed together, God, Son, Holy Spirit, individual and community, that we are one in the Spirit. So the Greek word, as we've discussed in, in past times, is, is parakletos, that's the noun. And there's not one good English word that does it justice. So it means several things. It means comforter. It means counselor. It means convictor, meaning the one who might point out to you that you're making some poor decisions, or maybe it's time to take a next step in your faith, to convict us that we need to be trying and working a little bit harder to get to Christ. It is our advocate. The word paraclete starts with para, like parallel. Two lines next to each other are parallel lines. And the paraclete is one who comes alongside of us and walks with us every day, but not just next to us, seeks to dwell within us, surround us, protect us and guide us. All of those are pretty good things. John also then goes on to talk about the Spirit as both teaching and helping us to remember. Teaching and remembering, two huge things for us. Every time we come to the communion table, many Christian communion tables have what? inscribed on the front. That's right. This do or, or do this in remembrance of me. When we break the bread, we break the cup, we are remembering all of God's gifts of love to us through Christ. It is the Spirit that helps us put those pieces together. And when we are in a Bible study, when we are in worship, when we are hearing the word proclaimed in music, in our own voice, in our prayers, through the sermon, when we feel a connection with God, if we are reading a book, listening to music, watching TV or a movie, gathering with friends, see something on the street, read the newspaper, anytime there's that God connection in God moment, that is the Holy Spirit doing its job. It makes it possible for the second generation forward after the resurrection, for us who were not there to bear witness to the resurrection. Do you get that? That's a little confusing. We weren't there to see Christ raised from the dead, but the Spirit comes for every generation after that to empower us, to help to teach us, help us to remember through these words of witness, through our life's experience, that Christ indeed was raised from the dead. It is so important for us. 
It intercedes for us when we cannot pray. It teaches us and is present in our prayer journey. We cannot build up the Holy Spirit too much. It is what ties us together. There's any mountain climbers in the room? This whole side? No. Okay. Well, there's kind of a funny saying about mountain climbers, and that's the reason that they're all tied and tethered together is so that the sane ones can't run home. (laughs) But the truth is they're tied together for protection. In case one falls, the hope is that this one can anchor this one while if they come free and can find footing again. It is to know that you are close and connected to other people who are doing the same things that you are seeking to do so you don't go off that cliff. The Spirit is that which connects all of us in the same way. We are all those mountain climbers. The Spirit was never given or meant to be given as an individual gift for me or for you or for any of us as individuals. It is a community shared gift. When we seek the Holy Spirit, we are seeking connection to one another and others who God is leading us to. The Spirit is strong and the Spirit fills and connects us all. Blessed be that tie that binds. The Spirit is the tie that binds us. Another piece, God is seeking to indwell within us, all of us, but we have to allow ourselves to be open to that presence. I know you're all up on your 19th century Russian Orthodox saints, so I don't need to go into detail, but Theophan the recluse Theophan the recluse was born in 1915, died 1894, was a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church, had a great quote about this. He said, find the place in your heart, talk with the Lord there, for it is the Lord's reception room. I like that. Your heart is is the Lord's reception room through the Holy Spirit. Think of our, we have a reception hall right out here. What do we do in that space? We meet together. We celebrate together. We do things throughout the season of the church year from lighting the lights on the Christmas tree. We have our Easter breakfast in there. We have receptions after worship. We come in and out of the church through that place. I have visited with folks in need in that place. We have laughed and cried in that space. All of that is a reception hall. And in the same way, Theophan the recluse is saying that your heart is that reception room for God, or so God seeks to fill us in that same place and do those same things for us to be with God in our hearts to laugh with God, to talk with God, to be greeted by God, to have fellowship with God and the Spirit of Christ indwelling in each one of us. Now, the the heart in in the Hebrew Bible, the understanding of our Jewish friends, was that the heart was the center of everything. We kind of separate head and heart. Head is our brain, so that's where our thinking is and our logic is and analytical thought, and the heart is more in the sentimental vein of where our emotion is. For the Hebrews, it was all encompassed in the heart, all together, the soul, the spirit, the life. So when we hear that God wants our heart to be, or we are told that this is God's reception room, it is the heart that God seeks. That is all of us to dwell within us so that we may be connected to one another and go into the world so that others may know this spirit. 
Different branches of Christianity treat the Holy Spirit in different ways. But at the end of the day, it has similar function, and that is the presence of Christ with us. Again, as one who walks in us, beside us, around us, and leads us. Jesus says specifically, I will not leave you orphaned, as he's talking to the disciples, as he's getting ready to leave them. They are anxious, they are upset. There's a story about one of those nature shows, if you've watched them, maybe National Geographic, something of the like, following a mama bear who gives birth to two cubs. Well, one of the two cubs dies at birth. The mother dies three weeks later, leaving the cub by himself to fend for himself in the world. And they've shown several times in following this cub that there's a mountain lion that is tracking the cub. Well, one day, the baby cub finds a huge black bear male, a literal papa bear. And sometimes those interactions don't go well, but this time it did. The papa bear looked around and saw there was no mother, there was nobody else. This cub was truly alone. So he starts to teach the cub how to hunt, how to run, when to stand and fight, all the things a parent would teach a child. So later on in the chronology, a few months down the line, the, the adult bear and the cub become separated. The cub can't find the adult male bear that's been caring for him. Well, as the cub goes down to the river to drink, he looks up, and who's perched on a boulder right there but the mountain lion. And we all think that this is not going to end well. So the bear does what the bear has been trained to do. This teeny little cub kind of toddles up on his hind legs, puts his little paws out, and what should have been a monstrous roar of defense just came out as this little bear cub squeak. Eep! Well, then the camera goes to the mountain lion. The mountain lion kind of moves back and then turns and runs away. And we're thinking, what in the world? How did that scare off that big bad mountain lion? When as the bear is sitting there on his own two legs, the cub feeling good about himself, the camera pans out and standing behind the bear cub is the male cub full stance, full teeth bared, claws at the ready silently. We know that that's what chased off the mountain lion. That is the Holy Spirit's relationship to us. The bear cub didn't know that that adult bear was there, didn't know what was going to happen, but stood up to do what he had been trained to do. Now, Here's where that sweet story breaks down. Preacher, if I follow the Holy Spirit, does that mean that nothing bad will ever happen to me? That your Holy Spirit as protector means that whenever danger or tragedy or suffering come into my world, that the Holy Spirit will rise up and chase all that away? I wish for all of us that was the case, but it isn't. We know darn well that sometimes the mountain lion gets the cub. But what we also know is that that Holy Spirit is always with us. Okay, preacher, let's talk Virginia Beach. Dwayne Craddock, overcome by evil and darkness, goes to his municipal building, 4 p.m., Two forty-five caliber weapons, kills 11 people. He is killed in, gun, in gunfire, four injured. Where, where was your big black bear then, preacher? Where was your Holy Spirit at that time? That Holy Spirit was in the heart of every person in that space. 
As I said, God said through Scripture, it will rain on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. God made no promises to us that when we follow, nothing bad will ever happen to us. But the peace that Christ gives us through the Holy Spirit, through his resurrection, is that we have the presence that is always with us, that we do not face these trials and tragedies alone, even if we feel like we are alone. God's heart was the first to break. God's eyes were the first to weep for everyone involved in that incident. God's spirit is real and it is full and it is seeking to be a part of us. And I also believe it was God's spirit that caused those to help one another, minimize the bloodshed in that place. Our brave and amazing first responders put their lives on the line to make sure that the damage was minimized. What if somehow Dwayne Craddock had had some kind of encounter that would have changed his life or caused him to sit down and say, maybe I need to think through this, to fight through that darkness and that evil? And that's where the Spirit comes in and that's where we come in. We are tethered to him even though we don't know it. Why? Because we are God's children and God created him just like God created us. I'm not letting him off the hook. Our hearts grieve and are broken for those who died and their families. I can't imagine the trauma. But the hope in this is just that. That because God sent us an advocate, a comforter, someone to walk with us and guide us and hold us and lead us, that we know that we are not alone. And when we find ourselves in moments of darkness, we know that should we open ourselves to God's presence, we will be led out. And should we seek, we can come home. So today, my challenge to you is simply to open yourself to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was getting the disciples ready. My peace I will give to you if you seek my spirit. It will teach, it will help you to remember. And then we realize that we are indeed tied to one another, tethered to one another for our own joy and celebration as a family of Christ. So let us open ourselves to the presence of the Holy Spirit. 